So, good afternoon, welcome. It's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Sayakar here to you. And even though it's my great pleasure, I will still have to read this because my memory is very, very short, so I apologize. Dr. Sayakar is Associate Professor of Mental Health Research and Co Director of the Centre for Co Production in Mental Health at Middlesex University. She has experience of mental distress and mental health service use and uses this to inform all of her work. She's also currently uh, acting chair of the National Survival User Network, ENSAM, a member of the editorial boards of Disability and Society and Lancet Psychiatry, among other things, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Throughout her working life, Sarah has published widely on meaningful co-production, on how power relations define participation initiatives and on user-led research. She has expertise in mental health service user and survival epistemologies, has written widely on personalization and personal budgets, and on the implementation of social care policy, as well as um, a quality and diversity policy on a number of sites. And um, her talk today is entitled, Who Benefits from Your Thinking? Thoughts on Service User and Survivor Research Leadership, Involvement and Ethics. And before I hand over to Sarah, I just wanted to say that, as you may know, um, this talk is being filmed. And also that, if you want to follow this on Twitter, there is a hashtag, which is uh, PPI who benefits, one word. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam, for that excessively generous introduction. <laughs> and now I know more about myself than I already did. Um, and thank you, everyone, friends, allies, fellows, comrades, for coming and, and hearing this talk today. I know some of you may even ventured down to South London to do so, so I do appreciate that. Um, so what we're going to do today really is explore why and how PPI, that's patient and public involvement, must play a central role in research governance and ethics. Not just at uh, the beginning for researchers conceiving, uh, convincing an ethics committee that you're not going to hurt anyone and uh, if you can just sort of slightly hurt them, you have to ask their permission to do so, make sure they know in advance. All those documents and bits of paper, although it's all important, or even stuff like the monitoring, the study conduct and processes, of course, this is absolutely vital as well. But what I want to argue in a way is that service users, patients, survivors and carers can use their unique perspectives and experiential knowledge to ask bigger ethical questions about a study and about research itself, as well as the conduct of a study. Service User and Survivor Research was founded, pretty much founded on asking the bigger and more critical questions about research, what you do with it, the way the knowledge is produced, constructed and used. The original idea of PPI, as Diana Rose has kind of argued, was to transform knowledge, which is itself an ethical issue and she's asked us to consider whether in a more radical sense changing the knowledge producers changes the knowledge produced. So I want to explore with you today what the PPI can have the potential to be a vehicle for some of those radical challenges that should be part of a revived service user, patient, survivor and carer led debate on research ethics particularly focusing on the concept of benefit. What's the benefit of research? Now, the idea kind of led on from a conversation I had with a woman at an event uh, here last year who heads a community support charity for people with sickle cell disease. And she said she was always having to field requests from, from researchers for participants and these researchers were sometimes a little bit nonplussed when she asked what the benefit would be for the users of her organization's support services and for the local black and minority ethnic community who the sickle cell disease affects and who she was working with. And it kind of wasn't really built into their thinking when they came to her and wanted to recruit participants to their study. So that got me thinking about benefit and ethics. So what I'm going to do is looking at what I'm calling the real story of research ethics, or it's certainly a story of research ethics, a history of research ethics, and rethinking benefit from a service user, patient, survivor, and carer perspective, and in 
exploring how those involved in PPI could also themselves be research ethicists. And I don't think that's as quite as difficult and as complicated as it sounds. So, who's seen this film? The Dallas Buyers Club. Who would have thought a film about a randomised control troll gone wrong could be an Oscar winner? Not me. <laughs> I was actually quite surprised when I saw it. I thought, oh my God, this is about randomised control trials. It's about research ethics. It's a bit of a busman's holiday game to the cinema to see that. But for those of who, you have, who haven't seen it, I'd recommend it as a case study in what I've called renegade PPI. But by patients involved in a randomised control trial of AZT during the 1980s, so AZT being the antiretroviral drug that was being developed at that time to treat HIV and AIDS, and I'll insert here a spoiler alert because I'm going to go into some of the, the plot now. So we've got Ron Woodruff, who's the kind of chief protagonist, with, with Rayon, who are participants in this trial, uh, with the research clinician, one of the research clinicians who's called Dr. Sachs. Um, and they discover as part of the trial that AZT is actually having quite negative effects on people. But Dr. Sachs' supervisor says... Just carry on, continue. But what happened to the people who were a part of the clinical trial, the participants, particularly Ron, he thought, this, th this drug is making me ill. So I'm going to go off and experiment with my own combination of drugs and supplements and see if they work. And they do. So he establishes the Dallas Buyers Club for HIV-positive people who then purchase uh, the combination treatment from him, all illegally, all off the record, but that's what happens. So Dr. Sachs is told by her supervisor to continue the trial even though the treatment has negative effects. So Dr. Sachs, being a bit of a rebel herself, starts to send the AZT trial participants to the Dallas Buyers Club to get this combination therapy that he's experimenting with. And she screws up the whole trial. And she loses her job. But together with her renegade PPI crew, she gives, they give people the chance to suffer less and to live a little longer. So I think the film deals quite well. Uh, it's also been a very good film, I think. Um, but it deals quite well with the questions of research ethics and benefit and harm in trials, and these are big questions, and ones that are bigger than can normally be dealt with one time on a research ethics committee at the very beginning of a study. And they're ones that service users and survivor researchers have asked of psychiatric research for decades. But why do we need research ethics anyway? Well, to put it quite plainly, as we'll see in the next couple of slides, it's because of human atrocities. Because it didn't matter that some people got harmed. Because of the value accorded to the lives of some and not to the lives of others. Because of how benefit was conceived for what Winston Churchill called perverted science. So this is some of the beginnings of ethical codes being developed in research. During the Second World War, a number of atrocities were carried out in the name of research. Severe, unethical human experiments were carried out by researchers affiliated with the Nazi Party in Germany. Patients with uh, physical disabilities, mental health problems, learning disabilities, and prisoners in concentration camps were forcibly experimented on to gather information about racial characteristics and genetics. After the war, these experiments were investigated and the doctors prosecuted in the Nuremberg trials, more specifically uh, the doctors' trials, which were a subset of the Nuremberg trials that began in 1947. And the woman you see here is Martha Moss. She was a Jewish doctor and she was a former inmate in a concentration camp testifying uh, at a trial um, of one of the doctor's trials in the subsequent Nuremberg proceedings. But from the doctor's trials, 
came the Nuremberg Code of 12 standards for the conduct of experiments with human subjects. And these are familiar to us today, or at least us who get far too stuck into research and carry out studies. The first and most important is that what anyone participating in an experiment must give informed consent. This means that no one can be forced to be a subject in human experiments. All participants must understand the risks of being involved. The code also gives rules for running experiments. For example, participants can leave the trial or experiment at any time they want. Doctors must stop the um, experiment if they realize it can be harmful to the patient. Also, no experiment can be made where the risks outweigh the benefits that can be had from it. So going back to the trial in the Dallas Buyers Club, you can see how many of these ethical codes were violated. And then the Nuremberg Code underpinned the World Medical Association Declaration of Helsinki, which is periodically updated, which has become the standard international reference point for research ethics. But it's not legally binding. So that's what happened in the European context. In the US context, this happened. The, the Tuskegee experiment was carried out by US public health services between 1932 and uh, 1972. So it went on for several decades. It was meant to be a longitudinal study uh, to follow the natural course of syphilis in 399 already infected African-American men in Alabama. The context will tell you a few things about the ethics already and 201 infected men. The men were not told they were being used as research subjects. And according to the Centers for Disease Control, the men were told they were being treated for bad blood. And here's a picture of them having their blood tested. Is your blood bad? We'll find out. They don't know. They're in part of an experiment. And the experiment had intended to show the need for additional services for those infected with syphilis. I don't quite know how. But when penicillin became available, which can treat syphilis, the researchers didn't inform these blokes. They didn't give them the treatment. Even those who were eligible for treatment when they were drafted into the army in 1942. The experiment was finally stopped in 1972 because it was exposed um, by uh, investigative journalists, um, I think in the New York Times, and it was, po uh, it was exposed to public scrutiny. So this experiment was one of the catalysts for the development of human experimentation guidelines by the US federal government. The story goes that in 1974, the National Research Act was passed, which established the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. And over the next few years, the National Commission issued some recommendations that outlined the principles of ethical treatment of human subjects. And I'm sure many of us in this room have been human subjects in, in research, as well as being researchers ourselves. And one of their reports has become another cornerstone of, of ethics. It's known as the Belmont Report after the um, conference center at the Smithsonian Institution where it was conceived in, in the 70s. It was finally reported in 1978. And it outlines three basic philosophical principles upon which ethical standards should be founded. And I'll go on to these now. They are respect, beneficence, and justice. And I'll read directly from the Belmont Report to, to, to give you a, a proper overview of what they mean by these things. Respect for the persons must be maintained. This protects the dignity of the individuals and also includes consideration of their autonomy and their right to make informed decisions on interventions that affect their destiny. This principle emphasizes the need for informed consent. 
The subject should understand the potential risks and benefits of participating in a research project. They should be willing participants. Beneficence must be considered, and this is what we'll sort of be focusing on as we go along. This ensures that the health of the individual will take precedence over the research hypothesis. All types of possible harm should be considered and assessed for on a regular basis. The risk of enrolment should be weighted against the potential benefit not only to the individual for his or her participation, and if I could speak in bold I would now because this is bold on my page, but also the benefit to society from the knowledge gained from the study. And justice must be upheld. No group should be singled out unfairly to participate for reasons of race, gender or socioeconomic status. On the other hand, when participation is felt to offer a significant advantage to the individual, all eligible groups should be invited to participate. And you can see from the Tuskegee experiment that the principle of justice was very important because it was essentially a racist experiment. So these philosophical principles have much bigger implications, I'd say, for ethics, that those involved with PPI or service user and survivor researchers can and should bring to you, be using to question the research they get involved with or, are, or asked about. And that is, what is the benefit to society from the knowledge gained from the study? And I think it's quite a good time to start asking that question. Because researchers in, in health and care, social sciences and, and generally are, are being asked more and more about what their research impact is. They're struggling with this at the moment, so we can give them a little hand. So research impact. What is it? Well, it's kind of divided into three, three things by the Economic and Social Research Council. And this is where PPI can play a big role. When asked, well, what's, the point? what's the point of this research? What impact is it going to have? What's in it for service users, patients, carers, communities, their organisations? What's the benefit? And in the light of what we know about the origins of ethical research codes in the West, asking questions about research impact as well as conduct is vital. Researchers use as evidence to inform and justify things like medical treatment, clinical decisions, and health and social policy. We could go on. And we're stakeholders in all those things. So here are the three different types of impact. Academic impact. And that's the one that researchers are really preoccupied with. Um, even, even applied researchers um, who work in universities, even people like me and Stan that try and do our best, we are still subject to our employees' expectations and their attentions there because of something called the Research Excellence Framework um, by which university researchers, academic researchers um, and university performance is judged. We're expected to publish in high impact journals which have paywalls so only a very few people can get to the papers. Um, it's about individual and institutional performance. It's about competition and there are very mechanistic and quantitative ways of measuring impact. It's about weighting and metrics, and I really don't understand what, how they work these things out. But there is, a, at the moment, I know I think a lot of people who work in universities in research posts would agree, there's an overemphasis and obsession with academic impact. And for the areas we work in, this is, can restrict those participating in PPI, their activities. So often people's involvement gets reduced to advising about plain English summaries and dissemination plans. So how, are we gonna, how can you help us achieve impact? But the kind of concept of impact is, is really, really small. But in order to assess impact, people should be there right at the beginning, asking big questions about other sorts of impact, those two sorts of impact, the economic 
and societal. Because these are where questions are about benefits to society, going back to what was important, they highlighted as being important um, in the Belmont report. And we know these economic and societal impacts because we live with them. We're the people on the receiving end of the decisions based on findings of research. Our treatment, socioeconomic decisions, health, welfare, all those things. So this picture I've chosen because it kind of encapsulates the problem. Now I would say from a feminist perspective, her problem is an economic and societal one. But for the person that, that did the clinical research, it was a kind of an academic and scientific one because he, and I'm saying he, of course it could be a she but probably not, um, was very keen to develop a tranquilizer um, to help her feel less anxious because he can't set her free. But if somebody like her was involved in PPI, which of course wasn't possible at the time, could there be a different conversation about why she was feeling anxious? What's the root cause of her anxiety? Are there other ways to approach this question other than getting a pill to alter her brain chemistry? So, implications and implementation of research. So what, what, one of the things that you can ask in PPI, and I think you sh should be asking right at the beginning, and researchers need to factor in PPI at the beginning when they're conceiving their question. What are the implications of asking a question? Um, here's a question that was asked a little while ago, a few years ago. It was, it, it was a very controversial question, as you can see, on the BBC uh, website. Now I know they don't have to put their questions through research ethics committees and, and you know it takes months and, and then they go out there and ask should homosexuals face execution. Um, but there just wasn't any ethical reflection on the impact of that question for the LGBT community or anyone else. Was that an okay question to ask on a public forum? A lot of people thought no. But the point is nobody thought it through. Nobody thought about the ethics of asking this question. So it's important to ask, why ask this question at all? What do we want to find out? Is it okay to ask this question? And that doesn't mean to imply that there should be censorship about asking research questions. There should just be scrutiny and dialogue about the implications of asking them. And will the findings be beneficial and here I've got a front cover of a report called A Life Apart. And I often um, refer to this um, as, as a turning point when the subject of a research study stuck two fingers up to the researchers. In 1972, a couple of social scientists called Miller and Gwynne carried out research into independent living uh, and uh, with disabled people living in a group home. So in 1972, most disabled people lived in institutions and they produced a report called A Life Apart where, where well, on one, on one um, side they claim to be uh, unbiased, a very neutral, objective but on reading it it's very clear that they're conceptualizing disabled people as what was known as socially dead, unproductive individuals and even going so far to say or imply uh, that disabled people living in institutions are parasites. Well, one of the uh, blokes who was disabled blokes who was involved as, as a research subject in that study wasn't having any of this. And a few years later, he wrote a paper in 1981 called Settling Accounts with the Parasite People. His name is Paul Hunt, and he's also a disability rights activist, and I don't blame him after being uh, uh, involved in such a piece of research with such outcomes. And he argued that this research from his perspective was absolutely not unbiased, and that the researchers themselves were like parasites who betrayed the disabled research participants 
because the participants had taken part in the study with some hope that it would be beneficial to them and to provide some evidence uh, for independent living that could be of benefit to society. So asking will the findings be beneficial is very, very important for people who are involved in PPI to ask. Ask that of the researchers. Improvement. That's what we're talking about today as well. You speak to a lot of people who get involved in the service user survivor movement, patient organisations, PPI, across the board, whether it's service development or research, and there are two things that are very common. Um, one, is motiv one is people's motivations. Loads and loads and loads of people will say, we want to make things better, we get involved to make things better for others based on our own experience. And that's the motivation for research participants as well, and for survivor uh, researchers who uh, then go over and be really hardcore, a bit like myself. And what people are really concerned with as, as a result of getting involved in whatever they do, including research, is change. They want to see change, positive impacts. And then we come back to the idea of benefit. So this, is, this little picture is, is a project about beyond women's suffrage. Um, and there was a kind of a, like a radical branch of, of, of suff suffragism and, and women organising in working class communities and what they were doing is they kept asking questions. See, there's a woman there, she's out in the crowd raising questions, bigger questions. Okay, we've got the vote, but what about women's oppression in wider social and political context? We can go back to our poor, tranquilised woman earlier who must have been sitting there about 50 years later after these women were on the go. So it's about asking questions. But who in the kind of systems of power that exist in research, who is asking the questions or who can ask the questions? At the moment, PPI is still not very well defined or um, it's not practiced consistently, I think. So you've got people who are absolutely brilliant at it, fantastic, give up power, um, and PPI is, is a central part of the investigation. Um, and some people are just like guessing what it might mean, bunging people on an advisory group or one person on an advisory group. There are frameworks around PPI, some better than others. But it can end up being tokenistic and the influence of those involved can be limited to kind of things like advice, um, helping with administration. This is participant information sheet. Okay, thanks for helping us get our research grant. We filled in that bit of the um, form. Helping with gatekeeping, take us to your people, uh, or answering whatever questions the uh, researchers have. I think one problem that we do have, and I always say this in research, is that in the history of health research, the researcher-subject relationship mirrors that of the doctor-patient, and we can see that in some of the language of the early research ethical codes, where the doctor and the researcher are synonymous. So thinking about it, who actually has the power to ask questions here? And is it possible for those involved in PPI to ask the bigger ethical questions and about benefit and harm right from the start? What's the point of this question? What's going to happen when you get the answer? Who will benefit from the findings? Do they have the opportunity or the power to ask questions at all? Or do we, they, get conceived as just a different sort of participant who answers questions? Okay, they're not subjects, but they're still kind of not exactly researchers, so we'll just keep asking questions as researchers. So although research ethical codes are not legally binding, they demand that people think ethically and morally about research and the philosophical implications 
as well of conducting research and about the benefits. So I would say that PPI can be a vehicle for getting those independent perspectives, perspectives based on first-hand experience, on lived experience. Independent and diverse people um, asking the big questions about the social and economic impacts and benefits from the very start and ones that are bigger than research ethics committees can ask about conduct one time or a couple of times if your proposal goes back and you answer all their questions. Now I'm coming to the end because so, I'd like us to have a, have a think about this. So I'd like to sort of end on a couple of slides and I don't know if you can see this very well. Um, this is taken from uh, the obituary of one of um, my tutors um, called Professor Grace Janssen. And uh, she was a professor of, of theology and philosophy. And she grew to have a, a, a very clear idea of ethics, which she condensed for us into one quite simple question, which we can ask of others. And I would encourage those in PPI to ask it of others, but also of, of ourselves. We were her students, we were her researchers. And she kept asking us, who benefits from such thinking? And that's where I nicked the title of this um, presentation. And she had a story behind why she positioned herself like that, which is really interesting, and I'm probably not doing it justice to paraphrase it here, but basically she told us that she came to this position of condensing down the ethical question to that um, because of her encounter with uh, clinical research ethics and policy. Uh, she came from Canada, and in 1989, she sat as an ethicist on the Ottawa Royal Commission on New Reproductive Technologies, a, com a commission of the, of the great and the good, which looked at the ethical, social research, and legal implications of all the types of new reproductive technologies that were being developed. And she told us that the commission was quite fractured and quite difficult partly because, she observed, of the tension between the perceived social and economic benefits of NRT between the different players. And some people were very interested on the committee in legislating and finding ways to implement things like sex selection techniques, genetic manipulation, embryo experimentation, and she thought the end of their thinking from an ethical point of view was potentially eugenics in a country with a history of exploitation, oppression uh, of First Nations people. So she always taught her students to reflect very carefully on who benefits from such thinking. And I think this is a very important question to pass on to those involved in PPI who can ask researchers who benefits from such thinking. So a final note on a take uh, on, on QED. That's the researchy bit. Thus it is proven. She's looking, looked down a microscope, she's writing her paper and thus it is proven. But I'd say for PPI and all those from service users, survivor patient backgrounds who are interested in research and want to get involved with research, you have to question everything done. And that's it. Thank you.
seen a lot of studies. There was one recently, like a feasibility study on the use of body worn cameras in mental health wards. And there was all the, this research saying, oh, this is massively reducing the need for restraint. I can't imagine any service user or survivor even asking that question. Mm-hmm. Like, so if we're not, if it's someone doing the research, we, we don't know, we're not involved with it, we've just seen the publication, and we think this is not a question that actually is okay to be asking, and it's just going to increase coercion massively. Mm-hmm. How, what do we do? How do we challenge that? <laughs> I think this is probably where the collective response would be helpful so that you don't you are not isolated as one individual asking that question. But it's a question a whole lot of stakeholders need to be asking and that uh, a collective of service users and survivors. Um, I mean there is a survivor researcher network. And perhaps one of the things that that survivor researchers and people who are involved in PPI need to do is keep an eye on this stuff and work together to ask ask those questions. Because it's really hard to ask a question like that on your own because of the power dynamics involved. So it's a collective thing, I think. I mean, I could have asked this question. Or we can use, you know, chains of communication uh, and, and, and influence to, to get someone to ask the question on our behalf as well. Well, thanks so much. Really interesting. I just um, wondered what um, you could say a bit more about the, the concept benefit, because um, I'm involved with um, IPO UK and we do a lot of research. So we have a lot of members who are really, really keen to get involved in research. Mm. And um, I think what the examples that you gave where you sort of say, well, is this going to be a benefit to you? For example, um, you'll find out, like in my you'll find out what the level of risk is to you if you get pregnant or whatever, mm-hmm. or, you know, what, um, how likely you are to be ill or something. Then, People really want to know that, and they really want to help. But it doesn't mean that that particular piece of research that they do to try and find out whether that particular treatment is going to help or not. They might find out that treatment doesn't help. Mm. So, I mean, it's, it's not sort of it's not very black and white that this is going to be a benefit to you. It's just this is knowledge is going to be a benefit, might be a benefit to you rather than sort of the social wider question. So. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it can be benefit to, uh, benefit to, to individuals to assess their own, their own risks. And I suppose the, the question that will become, become more broadly than that is, I suppose it's one that was related to the idea a few years ago that people should be diagnosed with dementia and targets for people to be diagnosed with dementia. Why would you, what, what was the point of that? If there's absolutely no treatment and support and social care for people with dementia. So you discover something, but what are the implications of that for services and support and and, and the individual, but also the community of people that may have a particular condition? So I suppose that's the societal and economic question of, okay, we know this, and what are the broader implications? Thank you. Hi, Sarah. Um, I thought that academic, economic, societal thing was great, and your emphasis on how academic impact is just massively overemphasized in all this incredibly competitive space, and it almost feels like there's not much we can do about that. Have you got any examples or kind of rays of hope of, you know, stuff going on that mm. is actually focusing more on societal impact and economic impact of people? I think it is to just get different people involved in conceiving and conducting research studies of you know, academic researchers the f- number one they can get hold of the cash but they can also determine who's in the team um, and if you get a diversity of, of minds and, and perspectives in a team um, and also people who are linked in with different communities so I think some of the work 
that the ESLC is starting to do around um, mental health research and trying to link up with the voluntary and community sector is very good because you're bringing up a, a whole different constituency of people into the research um, who can you know, have a, a greater in, in influence over the impact. Do you think it's sufficient for research teams to be introduced to voluntary sector groups, or do you think we actually have to make more of a kind of stick approach to forcing them to do that? <laughs> Like the um, yeah. research networks that are really keen on that and others that just don't touch it at all. Yeah. <coughs> I suppose it's kind of what, little bit stick, little bit carrot, little bit educating conventional academic researchers about the benefit. And I do I do think that the stuff around research impact, if we have a proper conversation about that, um, and bring it bring it away from the anxiety about you know publications, um, we could have have a more more, more fruitful um, conceptualisation of what impact is. But you have do have to bring in people who are actually on the ground doing stuff. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. This is a question based on some recent experience ethics committees. And I just wonder what your thought was and what their role could be. Because at the moment it feels like they're there with very strict criteria about what they mean by ethics and what their role is. We were told our role is to protect people. Yes. From what? I'm yes. not quite sure. They seem to have their own idea about what that was. And it seems like that could be a real space for doing something differently. Exactly. And I just wonder if you have any ideas about. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I, because looking at the research ethical codes, they're quite broad. You can start different conversations within them and quite radical ones. But the way research ethics committees work at the moment is a little bit too clinically mechanised. And they cause a lot of anxiety when they should be help, helping people. Um, and I suppose it, it, it's people who are represented on, on, on the research ethics committees as well. I know that the NIHR School for Social Care Research has quite a good mix of people who's on there, who are on there. One of their committees, the, the, the Social Research Ethics Committee, which includes carers and, and, and service users. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it could be a lot better and I don't think it would take that much to think differently um, about about it and to make it less bureaucratic and, and, and more discursive to have a dialogue um, rather than sending back forms for six months. <laughs> um, one of the things you mentioned um, briefly was around the um, the idea of service, um, service development PPI and involvement and research PPI. Um, and the, in my head as well, these are two, these tend to be two different things. Mm. But when you talk about impact and benefit, how much of that could be um, leveraged, if you like, by kind of trying to join those two things together and trying to sort of get people to think creatively in trust and CCGs and those sorts of things around kind of linking the resources that they've got there. Kind of goes back to the ethics point as well, because mm. really, we're talking about infrastructure here around research. I think you're right. I mean, some of the some of the service development and support development questions are going on and people are struggling with them in practice, but because practice doesn't always have a fantastic relationship with research, there are all these potential projects mm. that could be really beneficial, even on a local level, that just keep kind of disappearing because things aren't linking up properly. So I think there's a job here for universities and the academy to work more closely with either, and I know you do work quite closely with, with, with trusts, but with the community sector, the voluntary sector, with user-led organisations, just around joining up research capacity, generating different questions, you know, constructing investigations in different ways. Um, it's kind of frustrating sometimes that that doesn't happen because you can see the constituent parts. Yeah, because I mean, when I, I used to work here uh, for the Biomedical Research Centre, 
And one of one of the things that I did when I was here was one of my du duties and jobs, if you like, was was helping um, build research capacity in the the NHS trust around. So for people, for, for people, um, so for academic nurses and um, people who wouldn't necessarily always be doing. Research, sorry, not academic nurses, clinical nurses. Mm. Um, to, and often they came up with really good ideas, mm. like much better ideas than what, what people in you know, academic, traditional academics mm. would come up with because they're on the ground thinking about the research mm. and they're thinking about the problems in live, if you like. Mm. And if you can somehow link that to you know, what service users survivors think as well, you have something yes. really powerful. And it just, it just seems to me that there's a bit of a missed opportunity, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I totally agree. And sometimes, you know, you, get, you might get practitioners, frontline practitioners talking and then service users talking and you compare the conversations and you think, well, there is a big overlap here. There are difficulties that they both encounter in services and systems which need investigating. <laughs> Um, in the context of, as you know now, there's a lot of um, emphasis on the impact, finding the impact of PPI. Mm -hmm. Now, the way that you phrase the question, I think, is, is also interesting because it opens up a kind of different way of asking the question, what is the impact of PPI? And for me as well, maybe a better mm -hmm. question, which might tell you what you said, is how can PPI or form of PPI help us change the impact of research or improve the impact of research. You see what I mean? Yes. Which actually looks at the conditions in which this, this figure is imprisoned mm -hmm. rather than methods of making the imprisonment better tolerate. Yes. You see what I mean? And then the second the question is, economic, academic, economic, societal, absolutely important to turn from the academic to the economic and societal, but also as you know, it depends on how questions of the economic are framed. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a lot of the time PPI mm -hmm. is used to facilitate cost-efficient treatments, or what are seen as cost-efficient treatments. Short-termism, uh, again, going back to something that relieves the pain rather than thinking about wealth, social wealth, in a very different way. So, it's the tricky thing is how do we turn to the economic and the social without returning back to the same, oh, let's get the sort of quick fix which makes financial sense in the short term. How do we do that? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what how we do that. We <laughs> <laughs> must be vigilant of, of that, I guess. Yes, so. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, again, we have to sort of say, well, what, what, what economic outcomes are you talking about? And who's benefit? And who's benefit of economic? Is it going to be, you know, is it going to be drug companies? Is it going to be, you know, people who want to do cost savings and, and, and are only, ind only interested in individualistic responsibilisation for misery. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, is that thing of keep, keeping on asking asking questions, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's about the, the final question, I think, um, that, you, that you put up about, you know, yeah, keep asking the questions rather than accepting conditions and the rules or whatever it is there as livable. <laughs> is, isn't that starting to happen with some of the sort of social determinants research that's going on, like the place on loneliness, for example, mm -hmm. that would be really interesting. Um, I don't think there's a quick answer to that, but I mm -hmm. think some researchers are really interested in focusing on a kind of less medical yes. problem there. Yeah. Yeah, some of I think some of the loneliness stuff could be very interesting, and I know it's um, Sonia Johnson at UCL, and some of, I, I found some some of the one of the studies that they brought out uh, that started to touch upon emotional and existential loneliness, which I think could be um, very ripe right subject matter for the, the survival in, in investigation. What is it like? to feel apartness from the world. How do you live your life like that? Um, rather than how many friends have you got? And how, how often do you go out? Um, and I, is your key work your only pal? <laughs> is that... Um... 
and as a lot of people who are receiving this film or will be seeing it on YouTube, I think it is, uh, sometime later, uh, wanted to be here in the video. That's why this has been set up. But unfortunately, we don't have a sophisticated knowledge to get <coughs> to ask questions or learn so Maybe we will at some point. You can, I can sort of do Twitter and things. He can do Twitter and things. <laughs> we can all do Twitter and things. Okay, so if there's no further any question right now, maybe there will be um, in a bit. Perhaps we can continue this conversation in, in the pub and invite us people to, to join us to continue some of this. And I would like to ask you to, to join me in thanking uh, Dr. Carl, Dr. Saraka for, for coming and talking to us about benefit in this way. Yeah, thank you.